Okay, it is four o'clock, so we shall begin. When it comes to the speakers we have in this series, one of the things I very much enjoy is the half an hour or so before this talk when I get to talk to them in my office and ask them a few questions. And it's rare that I get to ask questions like I did today, such as, is Valyrian steel real? How do they make swords in Game of Thrones? And which movies have, in fact, the best sword examples that I might be able to point to? So it's a wonderful chance for me to just to get to learn something that I'm so excited to learn about today. Our speaker uh, comes to us with a somewhat rocky start. They actually did electrical engineering as their undergraduate, but they saw the light in the PhD time and joined us in material science for his PhD. We have an undergraduate, masters and PhD conducted at Berkeley, followed by a very productive and a very interesting career at HP, where this as well developing many interesting uh, devices that many of us would have encountered in a lot of interesting technology. So, this was just a topic that I thought was so much fun and a wonderful chance to bring to the group today. Let's welcome our speaker, William Mimler. Well, thank you for having me again today. Um, you know, usually I like to start with something uh, kind of humorous, but uh, in light of what's been going on lately, you know, at this point I just want to give a really heartfelt thank you to all of the first responders, the firefighters, the medical technicians, everybody else at least. Uh, it's not just what's been going on here because in September we were sweating bullets for three weeks because of a fire that nobody else up here in Northern California heard about, the Pier Fire that almost destroyed our uh, mountain cabin in the southern Sierras that's in the only privately owned grove of giant sequoia trees in the world. And the firefighters, you know, they came in, they bulldozed a new road 40 yards downhill from all of our houses, and they set a backfire, and they stopped it. And so, you know, my thanks goes out to them for all the work they did there and all the work they did there. So you've had plenty of time to look at the title of my talk. Um, so let's move ahead. Uh, I got a lot of slides. Basically, uh, it's a lot of pretty pictures of swords and blades to look at. So just kind of sit back and enjoy. If you have any questions, you know, feel free to stop me at any time. I love to talk about this stuff. So. This is a brief outline. I'm going to kind of go through a history of weapons, iron and steel development and swords, all in just like 15 slides. <laughs> uh, simple discussion of the metallurgy of steel and uh, heat treatment. Uh, sword design and geometry, always you can look at a sword and tell what it was meant to do. Um, and then we're going to talk about pattern welding from historical necessity when you needed it to actually make tiny amounts of steel and build them together to make a big sword to today, it's a modern artistic statement. Pattern welded steel is no better than um, modern steels. And then I have a gallery of pictures of masterpieces for master swordsmiths. Uh, almost everything you see here is from my own collection. And then, you know, questions, uh, any discussion, I brought a few things to uh, look at here. And uh, please, uh, the, when I do show these things, don't touch the blades because especially in the Japanese ones, you put a fingerprint on the blade, it's gonna cost 100, 150 bucks an inch to repolish it. And you can't just repolish that little bit, you have to do the whole thing. So, wait a minute, wait a minute, did I lose? Yeah, here we go, there we go. Brief history of weapons, this thing's got a hair trigger. Anyways, in the beginning, you know, we have the same weapons that all animals have. We have our claws and our teeth, right? Unfortunately, ours aren't as good as other animals. So we needed tools. The first tools were rocks and sticks. We could already observe, and you can see today, that other animals use rocks and sticks as tools. Not necessarily, well, monkeys use rocks and fruit as weapons, too. Um, at any rate, a rock is a force multiplier. Now you've added weight to your fist and, you, and your hardness to your fist, so you can do more damage with it. A stick gives you leverage faster speed at the tip and keeping, you know, a dangerous, you need more than one person for the saber tooth tire, but still, you know. And then also you use natural weapons. You see the animals have better weapons than we do, so we use those as our weapons. Then eventually you began to modify these things to shape the stones, to sharpen the points of the sticks, to make them better. And finally, what only humans do, we combine these things to create unique and new and better things. Stick plus stone, ax. Stone or animal horn, tips on spears and arrows. Now they're much more effective. And then finally, metalworking begins with naturally found native gold and meteoric iron. So, human's first tool, right? Everybody knows how to use this. 
And so here's a couple examples of natural weapons from animals. This is a warthog tusk. Um, the, it's like about uh, 12 inches long along the outside edge of the curve. So you hold that in your hand and a good two thirds of that sticks out. That's much better than using your own claws. This is a marlin spike, both the material that it's made from and the name of the tool. This is actually a, a sailor's tool from the days of sailing ships. Uh, this marlin spike was the perfect thing to wedge into and untie soaked, soaking wet rope knots. Some more examples. So now this is flaking and grinding and polishing stone to get more effective shapes for what you need to have done. And then here's some examples. These are modern reproductions of stone axes. Uh, Celt is this thing with lots of little teeth on it. And tomahawks. Here are some examples of traditional Hawaiian weapons that use sharp teeth and either wood or in this case now another marlin spike here. And then here's an example, of kind of one of the very first. Yes, Lynn. Is the marlin spike? Is it a tooth? Is it? A it's the spike, spike off the front, the nose oh, of the okay. marlin fish. Okay. Yeah, it's, like a, it's the marlin it's spike. The <laughs> and so here you can see the little piece of meteoric iron that's been put into the tip of this narwhal horn. Um, it's you know the thing is about meteorite steel. It's very very high in nickel. You can cold work it. You can cold forge it. You can pound it and shape it into something when it's cold. When you heat it up, it falls apart because it's very brittle. <coughs> so now we move into a brief history of iron and steel. So the very first iron, like I've said before, it came from meteorite strikes. People found it laying on the ground. Um, the reason you know that this stuff is from meteorite strikes is because no terrestrial iron ore has more than 4% nickel, and meteorite steel is you know, 10, 11, 12% or even more. Uh, like I said before, it's soft and ductile. You can cold work it, but it falls apart under heat. Um, the oldest known artifacts are nine little tiny beads, just a few millimeters long, found in a grave in uh, Gerza, Egypt, and they're almost 6,000 years old. Um, the very first iron making was among the Proto-Hittites, about 2000 BC, but it also developed simultaneously in India, which we don't hear so much about with our Eurocentric uh, point of view. Uh, iron was in general use by the Hittite elites in the New Empire about 1400 BC, and the technology was widely dispersed after the fall of the Hittite Empire. They kind of had a lock on this technology. But it took several centuries before iron was really common and cheap enough to replace bronze. Uh, bronze is really not that much worse, especially if it's got a hardened, hammered edge. It's almost as good as the early iron. Uh, the thing that really brought iron to the forefront was there was a bronze shortage, and so they had to switch to iron. It's more complicated than that, but that was one of the big things. So here's that bead. This, uh, this is from the British Museum. This is a, one of the beads found. Um, I just love this slide. I had to put it in because when I was 12 years old, I worked in the Los Angeles uh, Natural History Museum doing exactly these things, typing up these descriptions of artifacts. So now here, now they took one of these beads and did x-ray, EDX, a whole bunch of different types of analysis on it, and to find out, gee, what's this stuff made of? And sure enough, yes, it was made from a meteorite. Question. So if you, if you go back to that next one, back, what is, it's kind of like orange. In this one. Yeah, it's rust. rust. Oh, is that, is that that simple? Yeah, okay. iron oxide. I thought it was, oh, okay, I thought it was a lot more complicated than that. <laughs> No, no, this is, again, this is, it's basically primarily iron, I think this was like 11% um, nickel and a few other trace elements that don't occur in earth iron ore. Okay. So, yeah, and see, this is actually, a, this is a meteorite now fragment from the same field from which that metal was taken and made into beef. And what they did was they take a little piece of the meteorite and again, cold working it, they pound it flat and make it into a little rectangle, and then they, they fold the rectangle around like this to make the tubes. Very, very painstaking work. And now here's the famous daggers from the tomb of Tutankhamun. Uh, there were two daggers discovered in the Carter expedition, um, one with the uh, gold blade and uh, one with the iron blade. These were dated, you know, 1300 BC-ish, and again, 11% nickel here. 0.6% uh, cobalt, you never find that in a terrestrial ore. So that's perfect mid-range meteorite ore. Now here's the iron carbon equilibrium phase diagram, and this is kind of a very simplified one. It's much more complicated than this, and I looked all over to find one that was kind of color-coded so it doesn't look so busy as it does in uh, 
black and white. But the thing, the, the, the part that's really important here is for blades, especially for swords, you're looking at a very, very narrow range of carbon concentration in here. This graph only covers, it's kind of fuzzy, but uh, up to 6%. And the only part we're really interested in for swords is like 0.5 to 0.8% carbon. Now, again, I want to point out this is the equilibrium phase diagram. So this is what, you, what happens if you very, very, very slowly cool from one place to another in your tempering process. However, many other factors affect the, the phase transitions that happen in the steel. So the cooling rate affects the final crystal structure. If you, this is a, so this is a, a slow cooling rate and this is a fast cooling rate. Now, there's a bunch of different things here, but see, look at this BS. This is a bainite crystal structure. This is a very desirable crystal structure for a sword. And if you can cool fast enough, you can lock in this bainite crystal structure, freeze it in place before it has a chance to transform into the lower temperature crystal structure. And then there are many other factors that also affect it. So the equilibrium phase diagram is only a starting point. Now, I just want to put in a little something about bronze, because a lot of people say, well, gee, you know, these pottery kilns they had back there, they can only go up to 900 degrees C. So how can you melt copper, which has got a 1085 degrees C melting point? The trick is, when you alloy copper with tin, the melting point drops. So if you're um, less than 22% copper, your melting point is within the reach of those ancient pottery kilns. So, what is a sword? Uh, ancient Japanese proverb says a soul, the sword is the soul of the samurai. Uh, my friend Jim Bersoulis, who is uh, one of the top custom sword makers in the world, says sword making is the most demanding, difficult, and rewarding aspect of bladesmithing, which is he has been doing for 40 years. And a sword's not just a big knife. A knife and a sword have completely different purposes in life. A knife is expected to, to cut very finely, hold a very nice sharp edge for a long time, hard to resharpen. The other thing that's detrimental with that kind of steel is if it's hard, it's brittle. So you don't want to make a big piece that's brittle. Knives, so swords, have to swing the impact on targets of a variety of different materials, you know, flesh, bone, shields, armor, other blades. It has to be really, really tough. It has to be durable. So you need something that's tough and flexible, not high Rockwell hardness. Uh, you know, a, a knife blade might have a Rockwell hardness of 60, whereas a sword, depending on the application, a big two-handed sword might have a Rockwell hardness of 48. So. A good sword steel, it's tempered for flexibility. Ah, okay, demo. So this is a, um, this is what's called a beater. This is used for sparring and stage combat. It's not sharp. Uh, the edge is about <laughs> two to three millimeters thick. Yeah, I, uh, thank you. Anyways, um, where were we? Okay, so basically, this is what you need to be able to do with a sword. Yeah, try doing this with a 99.95 stainless steel Japanese katana. You'll be, I'd be spraying you guys with sharp little pieces of metal. The other thing that you can tell about a um, good quality blade. Anybody still here? Yeah. Yeah. It'll go on for a couple of minutes. All right. Where's my thing here? What would a knife sound like? Excuse me? What would a knife sound like? Dink. Like... <laughs> Dink. Dink. Because it's too stiff to, to vibrate and ring very long. Okay? And so now you say, okay, so cutting swords would have very wide, thin blades and a rounded tip. They're meant for cutting and chopping things. A thrusting sword, like a rapier, have is long and skinny and has a sharp point. It has to be very stiff because you don't want it to bend when it's going into something. And a cut and thrust sword basically combines these two capabilities. This is an example of a cut and thrust sword. This is a sharp. This is, a, this is actually a duplicate of a historical sword. Um, this was the personal short sword of George Silver, who was an Elizabethan sword master in the court of uh, Queen Elizabeth. Um, my good friend Tinker, who's one of the top custom sword makers in the world, I sent him on the Concord to London, where because of who he was, he got to go to the Tower of London and handle and measure George Silver's personal sword, and he made me a copy out of modern steel. That's actually the character, one of the characters I play at the Ren Fair.
So that's a cut and thrust sword. It does everything very well. And the thing that most people don't realize is that thing's only two pounds, three ounces. It, like, weighs nothing. Okay, now as we're talking about carbon content in steel, this shows what types of carbon content are good for different types of things. Again, if you're looking at very low carbon concentration, under a quarter percent, you really can't harden it. Um, so that's good for just kind of general cheap uses. When you get right way up high, now you're looking for, you know, cutlery. This is small knives and things. And again, low carbon, tougher, high carbon, harder. For swords, you really want to be in the sweet spot right here. Remember I mentioned a couple of the steel alloys, 1060, that means 0.6%, 1070, 0.7% carbon. Yes? What do you mean by tougher? Tougher, that means able to withstand repeated blows without damage, without breaking. There was another question? There was another question. Okay. Yeah, uh, what do you, you know, if you say, I'm tough, what does that mean? That means you can pound on me a lot, right, and I can stand up and take more. Uh, and so, other useful alloying elements, uh, a trace of molybdenum, it gives more uniform hardening and makes increased toughness. Uh, around 1% of chromium, it makes it respond faster to the heat treatment, so again, we're playing with that cooling rate thing here. And then vanadium, in less than a quarter percent, it controls the grain structure, gives you more uniform grain structure through the entire piece. So, here's a, basically a few descriptions of the sword. Um, we all know what the point is, right? That's the end that you point at the other guy. And the point of percussion, uh, let's come back to that last. That's the best point on the blade to, to cut or chop with, minimizing the shock. The point of balance, this is easy for everybody to figure out, right? That's the place, and this is a really good one because it's got a big pommel back here. See, it balances just a half an inch in front of the guard, which means I can move really fast with that because I'm very close to the, the center of rotation. And that's this place, that's the best place to block something else and transmit the minimum amount of shock to your hand because if you think about it, if you block higher up, you're gonna to wanna to rotate this way. It'd be hard to block higher down on this one because of the balance point, but if you could, you would want to rotate this way and twist your wrist. If you get right on that point of balance, it's straight on and there's no torque to the wrist. Okay, the guard, cross guard, hilt, whatever you want to call it, grip, what I'm holding, and the pommel basically to move the point of balance farther down and change the, the uh, way it moves. Okay, now the point of percussion, well, you can, let's get into the next slide too. This has to do with harmonic balancing, which unfortunately harmonic balancing is what a lot of people call something that's got, that's a well-designed blade. It really is the wrong term to say, but when a long thin object vibrates, it flexes back and forth, right? The, the less stiff it is, the bigger the excursions in the flexing. And it's determined by what it's made of and how the mass is distributed along that length. So, what it really means is, harmonic balancing means that the sword is properly designed to minimize the transfer of shock to your hand. So there's going to be nodes in this blade that don't move, right? When the thing's vibrating back and forth like this, there are places that don't move, the zero crossing, if you will. Um, and one of them should be where you put your strong hand on the blade, and then the other one is where you want to hit things with. Now, you can develop a multi-dimensional matrix and solve this with circuit analysis, or you can just do this very simple experiment. You see that place that's not moving? And you see where I have my hand is? It's not moving right where my hand is, moving more down there. This is where you want to hit for maximum effect and minimum shock to your hand. That's the point of percussion. Question? Yes. So if the guard on the previous slide, if the guard is not for blocking, it's for it's it's so once you've blocked it prevents the blade from sliding down. down to your hand, right? That's the main purpose. So the Kopesh, a lot of people say this is the first sword. Um, well, yes and no. Uh, the Kopesh is the Egyptian name for the Canaanite sickle sword that was first used against them in battle, and they said, Oh man, this thing is so good. We want these too. Um, but 
the origins can actually be traced back to Sumer, and it was originally a, a weapon called the Epsilon Axe. Um, it was later adopted by Egypt, first as a symbol of royal power. Hey, look, we beat those Canaanites, and I got the, I got the Kopesh now. But eventually, it became a common tool used by the troops. Uh, Ramses II was the first pharaoh to use uh, the Kopesh in warfare, and this was his ceremonial Kopesh. So this shows the development of the Kopesh from the ex Epsilon Axe. This is a, a stone bas relief from an Egyptian tomb that shows an Egyptian soldier with it. This up here is a uh, uh, kind of a modern artist's conception of some company that sells these things for historical reenactors. And this kind of shows here the stages in the development from the Epsilon Axe into the Kopesh. So here's three historical examples. The top one is the, the what we call the proto-kopesh. It's the first one that switched from that epsilon axe form to the single piece form. Then Tutankhamun's tomb, there's one of the two kopesh that were found in his tomb. And finally, this is another picture of the uh, kopesh of Ramses. And it was definitely ceremonial, because if you look at this thing, it's just like my beaters. It does not have a sharpened edge on it. So it's just a symbol of power. Okay, then we look at some uh, European and Mediterranean bronze swords kind of moving a little bit more forward in history. All of these swords are made by a man named uh, Neil Burridge in England, and he makes absolutely the best modern reproductions of ancient bronze weapons anybody in the world. He makes his own stone molds to do castings, and then you can see in some of these pictures, this is, where, this is the one that shows it best. See these lines along here? This is what's called a double hammered edge. Bronze work hardens and becomes tougher and harder. And so you pound the edge down, condensing it, and then you do that again a second time. You get a very, very tough edge that could go edge to edge with the, you know, the lousy iron that they had at the same time. It was very competitive. Then here's a uh, straight sword from uh, Aegean, Mediterranean style. And then here's kind of one of the classic uh, leaf blades, the Urnfield. And again, you know, look at the weights on these things. You, you, even bronze. Bronze is heavier than steel, than iron. And yet, all these things, they're just, they're under a kilo in weight. They're not heavy. These are bronze. How do you account for the color? The color? Yeah, they don't uh, bronze. Lighting. Yeah. Just lighting. They're very, very highly polished. <laughs> And then some, somebody was talking about gladii earlier. So here's three of my, my gladii. You can see my, my favorite is this, uh, the leaf bladed one. I'm, I'm a sucker for leaf blades. Uh, these are three made by, I think, uh, yeah, Atar made two of these. So the top one is a tinker version. Um, then this middle one is uh, Master Atar. This one's pattern welded. You can see here the, the contrast, the light and dark layers in the blade itself. Um, that's the contrast difference between high and low carbon steel layers. Um, and then the bottom one, basically, this is, the, this is the show one. This is the sparring version of that same blade. OK, now you, the migration era is basically proto-Vikings, OK? This is before there were people who were called Vikings. There were you know, migrating tribes moving back and forth over northern Europe. And one of their classic blades was the sax. In fact, the Saxons are named because of the sax. The Frankians are named because of the, Fra the axe. And so this basically, the sax, the one thing they have in common, they can be anything from a little working knife to a big sword, they have a single edge and a very, very thick spine. So this particular one uh, is made by uh, Rocky Lemon from Oso Forge. Um, uh, I guess I have time to throw a little story in here. So um, this is, uh, you know, I say it's a uh, Vimosa sax. That means there's a, a ship grave in Vimosa, Sweden, that sh they dug up um, saxes of this particular pattern, that shape of the blade. It's a shape of the blade that I really love. It's like a great big, you know, kind of chef's knife kind of thing. And like the people who know me know, the kind of knives I like is great big cutting thing, little bitty thing to hold on to. And so uh, Gretter's, Gretter, the Strong was an actual historical character who lived back in the uh, you know, 1100, 10, 1100 era. He was a real person, uh, and one of the Icelandic sagas is written about his life story. Uh, so uh, it's a real long story, but basically he 
finds this in, a, in the grave of the grandfather of one of the kings that he's staying with on an island. It's a long story, so I'm not going to tell the story right now. But he basically, according to the saga, he has to fight the ghost of the, the grandfather of the king to get the sword. And he comes back and gets the sword. But he doesn't get to keep the sword then. He has to do something heroic. And he does something heroic later, so the guy gives him the sword. But he cuts off the paw of a cave bear with one swipe of that thing. Anyways. I, I really, you know, wanted to get a modern version of that thing, so I've actually commissioned that sax from five different smiths for them to deliver today. So now another common ancient weapon is the falcata. This was uh, especially um, um, useful in the hands of the Spanish and Southern French Celtic tribes when the Romans first came across these guys fighting with these falcatas. This is basically like a big axe. The spine on this thing is like that thick. Okay. Basically, it would crush the helmets. After the, after the Romans met the falcatas, they added the reinforcing bars across the top of the helmets. <laughs> OK, now this is a page out of one of Clement's books. Uh, all the, uh, the references are in the bibliography page at the end, so you don't have to write that stuff down. This kind of shows the development of swords during the medieval period, where it really kind of exploded in all sorts of different types of swords. So you're basically looking at pure choppers up here, going down into long, real, true two-handers here, and then into the rapier, the pointy swords over here, and many, many others that don't show up on this diagram. But so here's an example I mentioned, cutting and thrusting swords. So the top one is, these are all uh, tinker swords, except for the sword cane at the bottom. Uh, the top one's got a name, it's called Zephyr, because it's really quiet when it cuts through the air. But that blade is so thin, you can flex it almost double the amount of that beater that I showed you there. And again, it, if, you, if you try to thrust it at something, the blade will just fold up kind of like that and spring back. It's meant for cutting down unarmored peasants, what can I say? This is the uh, cut and thrust sword that I showed you, the uh, George Silver. And then down here is a uh, tinker dueling saber. So this is kind of transitioning more and more. Now, this is a very, very stiff blade meant for poking holes and things. And then finally, the uh, pokiest thing of all is the sword cane, which is just a big piece of wire that's sharpened at the end. Yeah, I like the big stuff. So, pattern welding. Uh, those, were, um, those were actually two-handed dueling swords. People would duel unarmored with these. You had to be serious, yeah. The other thing that those would be used for would be defending stairways in a castle. Remember, the stairways circle up in a particular way. They're designed so that the people looking down have the advantage. The people looking up don't have, have a disadvantage in terms of they have to strike you know, against the wall. The people coming down have lots of room to strike down. But these would be used, you know, just poke down and they couldn't come up. So, like I said before, with the primitive smelters they had, you can only mix small amounts of iron at a time, just little tiny bits. Uh, the the, the proto-Vikings basically use what they call bog iron, which is they dig up the peat at the bottom of the bog and process it and get little tiny crumbly bits of iron out of it and make that into iron bars. So if you work the iron in a charcoal forge, you accidentally do get steel incorporated into that, uh, I mean carbon incorporated into the iron, and you have steel on the surface layers. If the pieces of iron are small enough, they become steel all the way through if the carbon can migrate far enough in. So the Celts originally developed these techniques to twist and forge together all these little bits of, of steely iron, and then you gradually build it up and you make a whole blade. But in doing that, you made really, really cool pattern doing that too, and the pattern shows in the blade. The Vikings developed deliberate patterns that they tried to create artistic patterns in the blade, the classic one being the serpent and the steel. Um, unlike modern pattern welding, where they etch the blades to enhance the contrast, like you saw in that earlier picture, the Vikings and the Japanese did not um, etch the blades. They're highly polished, so you can't really see the pattern under, except under certain conditions. And like with the Viking sword, in cold weather, if you breathe on it, your breath condenses on it, and that changes the optics enough so that now you can see the pattern until the, the water evaporates. So the also, other ways to do it were these, you could take these steel layers and you can forge weld them onto a softer iron core. The Japanese had a couple of techniques for doing this. Uh, San Mai is basically sandwiched, so you have a core and then two panels on both sides of that. 
Kobuse is like the same thing, so it's like a taco. So you take the outer tough stuff and you fold it around the iron core like that, all the way down the blade. Uh, now, yeah, somebody asked me about this before too. Uh, Damascus is not a pattern welding, though marketing people have confused this uh, over the last hundred years or so. Uh, Damascus is a crucible steel, which means it's it's got a, a point-like microstructure to it. But the human eye is always trying to put patterns on something. If you look at this stuff, you'd say, wow, yeah, there's a pattern in there. And so that's why people confused it with pattern welding. But it's a completely different thing. Uh, Damascus came re really came from India in the 6th century BC. The Arabs later brought it to Damascus, which is where the Europeans heard of it. And so the Europeans know everything, and we're, you know, we're right about everything. So we said, it's Damascus steel. But today, there's no strength advantage in pattern welding, because with modern steels and modern heat treatment process, you know, processes, you can make either type of steel equally good or bad. It's all in the heat treatment and the steel you begin with. So, how do you do this? Well, the simplest pattern is a straight laminate. All of the Japanese pattern blades are straight laminate or what they call mokume or wood grain. So, what you do is you start with a layered metal and you just basically, these are the simplest ways you look at it is it's high carbon, low carbon, high carbon, low carbon, high carbon. Okay? You take all these things in, in kind of thin layers, you stack them together, you wire them up real tight, you flux the heck out of it, you put it in the forge and you hammer it into a single piece of steel. Okay? Take it out, cool it down, start over again. Fold that over, double the layers, same thing, forge it together, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, and eventually you get what's called the straight laminate. Now, if you were just looking at the bar, you wouldn't see any pattern, but because in the knife, they grind, right, to make the edge in the knife, you're now grinding through the layers, exposing the pattern. Okay, so here are two um, different patterns. Now this is the one I just showed you, but this is the, I'm showing you the full blade here. It's made by uh, Dilbert Ely, uh, yeah, meteorite, mokame, and uh, hippo tooth. Uh, you can maybe see in here, the uh, bolsters here are pieces cut out of the original meteorite that the blade was forged out of. And so you can see the crystal structure of the meteorite here in the blade. And on the edge that you can't see that's facing that way, you can still see the rusty outer surface of the meteorite. Uh, the top one was made by uh, Jim Persoulis, um, uh, meteorite, nickel iron, silver, and uh, bone grip. And that's another uh, ladder pattern uh, there. Again, it's called a ladder pattern because really it does look like the rungs of the ladder there, the light and dark. I'll show you what causes that in, in just a second. So here's a now forward curved blade, which means the blade's curved like that. Um, at the top, you've got a bolo style knife uh, with Jim Ferguson uh, ladder pattern there. It really shows the, the light and dark contrast in the ladder rungs on that one. And then a carved ebony grip by a guy named Othan who did some beautiful work and then disappeared off the face of the earth and I can't find any find them anywhere anymore. But I have still have a piece of ebony that's four inches around and six inches tall that he carved into snake scales. I still don't know what to do with it. And the bottom now is a uh, Jim Hersulis uh, raindrop pattern, uh, horn and bronze grip, uh, kukri, uh, the Gurkha knife. This is one of the knives from the cover of his uh, second book, I believe. Now, here, here you get an idea. This is a close-up of Jim Ferguson's ladder pattern, and now you can see where those ladder rungs come from. They come from the way the light strikes the different angles of the layers. And if the light strikes at different angles, that pattern's gonna move. And so if you have you know, a ladder pattern blade and you move it around like this, the ladder moves on the blade. So it's, it's really cool. And here's a close-up of the rain dot pattern. And then here is one of the only two pattern welded blades that Tinker ever made. Too much work. And then here's what I mean by the serpent and the steel. See, here's, here's the, this is what's called a, a twist pattern here on both sides. And then the center part here is what the, where the serpent is. And then this is a very, very high density laminate edge. So it's maybe, you know, uh, 1,200, 1,500 layer edge here. So you can barely see. The, the grains in there. Now, you people hear about, oh, 1,000 folded blades. Well, when you time you fold it 1,000 times, those layers are so thin that it's all mushed together. It doesn't matter anymore. And even, you know, there's a point beyond which the carbon migration will smear it out, too. So you really 
really don't go much beyond about you know 10 or 12 folds typically. Uh, you remember the old story about the you know how many uh, grains of rice you have if you put one on the first square of a chessboard, two on the second, four. There's not enough rice in the world by the time you get to the end. Okay, here's another guy named uh, Yule. Uh, he uh, lives in um, uh, New Hampshire, and he does uh, mostly uh, um, yeah Viking type stuff. These are all uh, examples of different patterns that he's uh, made up. And here's uh, one that's called Hugs and Kisses that Jim invented. See, here's your Hugs and Kisses along the spine here. That's, that's really what you need to do. And then but you can also make pattern welded blades out of cable. Essentially, you take steel cable and flux the heck out of it and pound it into a single piece of steel. And then you can make it into a bar and make nice knives out of it. So again, these are kind of different ways that it looks. The top one is... Uh, uh, Tony Lemon, uh, and that's got a kind of a very, you can see the twist actually that was in the original cable as it goes down the blade. Now Rocky, that's uh, Tony's brother, um, did a different one where he untwisted the cable and so it's all really weird and squiggly on that one. And then here's one that um, Jim made. And finally, you can make this, it doesn't have to be cable, here's one that Jim made out of the uh, timing chain off his F-250 after the engine blew up. He said, what am I going to do with this timing chain? I can make a knife out of it. That's what he thinks about everything. What can I do with this leaf? Spring? I can make a sword out of it. So now here's, here's something that's really cool. It's the same blade, but the two different sides of the same blade. And it has two different patterns on it. OK? Now you say, oh, wait a minute. I, I gave it away here, what the, what the uh, reason is. But basically, you know, how does something like this happen? It happens by grinding irregularly. If you grind it. Symmetrically like this, both sides look the same. If you grind it at an angle like this, here's the one side where you don't see many layers, and here's the other side where you see lots of layers. Okay, and you can do this in precious metals too. I, I have a long quest to do this, you know, being interested in blades and pattern welding and stuff like this. Uh, one time I was getting, well, actually, you know, we, my wife and I re renewed our vows, and so I wanted to get a uh, uh, some special rings made for us, and I went on a long, long quest of many years to do this and many trials and errors. And, and the only person I've ever found that could do this in a precious metal was a lady named Tima, Tina Aspiala in Finland, and she's no longer doing jewelry work, so don't try to look her up and bug her to do this. But this is Star Twist in 18 karat red, yellow, and white gold. Same as a, same as a sword, the Star Twist and the sword pattern you just saw. And so now I'm just going to show a sort of gallery of some masterpieces by some master smiths. So all these guys are friends of mine, uh, Jim Versoulis and Henderson Nevada, um, Tony Lemon in uh, Bakersfield, John Luce in Vermont, uh, Michael in uh, Seattle. Now, I have to say that uh, Michael is no longer taking commissions. Um, Jake hasn't been taking commissions for years now. Um, but uh, Jim, Tony, and uh, Oso still do. So here are some of uh, the Japanese swords that uh, Master Atar, that Jim has made over the years. Um, he has written uh, three books already, and um, Jim and several other master smiths about 40 years ago, through trial and error, figured out the way the Japanese made steel a 1,000 years ago. These four guys basically rediscovered it for themselves. Um, the other three guys are dead. When, um, when Jody Sampson died, who was the, the last one of the three, I, go, I called up Jim on the phone and I said, you know, Jim, you're the only one left of these guys that has all that stuff in your head, and if you don't write a fourth book and get it all out, it's going to be gone for another thousand years. So he said, yeah, 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 okay, Bill, I'll write a new book. But to, to illustrate the book, i got to make a, a new, I know I said I'd never make another Japanese sword again, but I, I will make a numbered edition of 125 Japanese swords to illustrate the book. And uh, so he did. Uh, the book's still not out yet, but I like to say, well, at least I gave him a little kick in the pants to you know, get that book gone. It's supposed to come out this year. Uh, so anyways, these are several. Um, now, at the top, you see a straight sword that looks like a Tai Chi sword, except it's, it's got a, a less fancy guard on it. So that was the original style of Japanese sword, the Ken style sword. Basically, it's double-edged and straight. It's light and nice. I actually, 
I like that blade a lot. For years, I was after Jim to make me a European straight double-edged sword with a temper line in it. And he said, Bill, I'll never make stuff like that. It's not historically accurate. So, but even for one of the prototype blades for his Japanese uh, stuff, he did a Ken-style sword, which is a straight double-edged sword. And it does have a temper line on it, so I'm happy anyways. Now, the bottom three swords are a uh, matched set of three swords that he made for me. There's a great story that uh, goes on these bottom two blades here, which you can see are very, very big blades. Um, so now this one, this one, these two, the second one and the fourth one, these are the traditional curved katana style with the um, single cutting edge on them. This sword here is of particular interest. This is the transitional sword between the straight Ken style sword and the, what we call the modern katana. It was invented by the Japanese master smith, who's also considered a saint, um, Amakune in the 8th century. He's the guy that invented the katana, and in inventing the katana, he did that transitional sword that is curved and double-edged, at least that far down, and then it's single-edged in this last part there for strength. Anyways, these two swords are really special. Um, so Jim is a uh, Kurdan Greek by ethnicity, and he's a Zoroastrian um, by religion. So how many people know what Zoroastrianism is? Eh, a few people do, yeah. Anyways, they have a god of fire and light, Ahura Mazda. But until they started making all the light bulbs in China, you used to be able to, when you buy a light bulb, you'd see on the little logo on the top of it, it said Ahura Mazda on it. Not, not for like 20 years anymore. But anyways, so, or, uh, so anyways, so several years ago, um, Jim's wife, Sue, um, had a medical problem and she went in for uh, emergency surgery and we weren't, sh yeah, we weren't sure if she would come out the other end. It was like 50-50. Um, Jim's method of praying for his wife's life was to go into his forge for almost three days straight, nonstop, and forge meteorites down into a single billet of steel. Uh, forge and folded and folded and folded. Out of that billet came two blades. These are them. I like to call that Sue's ingot. So those have special meaning for me. I did bring one of these today. And this is uh, Kogarasu Maro, the little crow, the transitional blade. Now, he actually made me, you notice it's a very long blade on that. So that's what you'd call him. Oh, Kogarasu Maro, a big little crow, two-handed one. And here is, so now, a couple terms, the hada and the hamon. The hada is the grain structure, the Japanese word for the grain structure. Again, this is polished. So the only place you can see the grain structure is in the place where it's transitioning from one crystal structure to a different crystal structure, and it's you know in between there. And so you can see the high and low carbon contrast coming out there. So that's, and, and then the, uh, so the layers. Now the hamon is this actual temper line that wiggles down the blade. And there are many, many, many different styles of temper lines where you deliberately try to create certain shapes of filigrees in those curves. Um, I, I can't get it. There's lots of details, but this is a particularly nice one because it has these little floating islands here and there of intermediate material, with suri. And then he doesn't just do Japanese stuff. He mostly does uh, European-style <coughs> blades. These are three of his high-end uh, pattern weld, the European ones. Uh, again, these two, uh, that's a... Uh, uh, barely etched uh, ladder pattern up on the top, and then these two are these multi-core uh, Viking-style patterns on the bottom. Here's a couple of uh, Tony Lemons pieces. Uh, this was, uh, I think, 2003 Halloween steel. Every Halloween, uh, uh, Oso and Rocky and a bunch of other smiths get together and they stay up all night forging some crazy steel, and nobody really knows what it's going to look like until you check the next day. And this was, this was a 2003 Halloween steel. And here's a big Bowie. Now this one is in San Mai construction. So you can see here, this, what's showing at the edge is, now in this case, this is a modern San Mai. So this is reversed from what the Japanese used to do. So the, the middle, the filling of the sandwich is ultra tough steel. The outside is really cool pattern weld made from 1880s um, railroad rails, the bread. And then here's a close-up of the pattern, and then this is a this is actually a spacer here is a piece of uh, fossilized uh, mammoth ivory. You can see the the natural checking in the interior of the ivory there, and nail corn. 
And uh, here's uh, one of my favorite things that uh, he used to be called John Loose before he changed his name to Yule. Uh, this is uh, Bill's Bowie, is what he calls it. But uh, beautiful uh, work on this uh, flamed uh, maple scabbard. Here's a close-up of his pattern. Now, again, this is a multi-bar pattern, right? So there's one bar of twist that goes this way, another bar of twist that goes that, that way, and it's actually even more complicated because this isn't going to go all the way through the blade. There's another one on the other side so that the pattern goes the other direction. So it's one, two, one, two, and then one for the edge. Here's a couple of their other Dark Ages saxes. These were very, these were what would be called war knives with uh, 10 to 14 inch long blades. And very, very traditional scabbard designs. He loves doing the historical stuff. And here's uh, some of uh, Tinker's work. Uh, this is an engraved Viking set. This is one of the really nicest sets he's ever made um, with a classic Viking sword on top and a, and a sax at the bottom. This is a, uh, um, basically a hunting saber at the bottom, so I just had room to squeeze one more in even if it didn't fit with the other. And these four I like to call Tinker's Nightmare. These are the last four blades he made before he started, decided to give up uh, blade smithing uh, commissions. These are the last four blades he made for me, and that drove him over the top. No, actually, you know, I won't go into what his real problem was. But, so the top one's called Hakadam. This is like big, humongous Viking sword. This is a, because I'm strong. I like big swords, and so this is about a pound heavier than a typical Viking sword, much wider, much longer. It's like Hakadem, right? It's nothing fancy. It's made for, you know, cleaving helmets, splitting shields, chopping mail, yeah. And then this is another one of Gretter's saxes, but made by Tinker. And then this is a uh, Falcata. Uh, I actually showed you a uh, uh, historical Falcata, and I have a... Uh, I don't know, something here. This is, this is that blade. Looks and, like it's like super efficient. Oh yeah, it's, it's basically a long axe is what it is. That's why, you know, it's chopping the helmets. Yeah, you can see. And it's got a lot of weight out here where that's where you want it. In this case, the point of percussion is the thickest part of the blade. And hard to lose. <laughs> Uh, are some of these swords like illegal to have because they're super dangerous? Uh, yeah, depending on your locality, there are various regulations, especially on um, double-edged blades. Yeah. yeah. Um, now, the, my local police know me and they know what I have in my collection. And, <laughs> and of course, actually, I don't keep any of this stuff at my house. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, got a, I got a friend with his stuff's way too valuable. I've got a friend with a gun shop, and he, he bought an old bank building for the gun shop, so in the vault there's two of my safes. And that's, that's where this stuff lives, except when I bring it out to places like this. And then so the Falcata, and then finally this is a big Bowie, 16-inch blades. I like big Bowies. I like big everything, anyways. Okay, what's next? Wow. Time. And finally, here's a close-up of uh, Jake Pounding's Thorfinner Sonauter. This is another version of Gretter's sax. Uh, Thorfinn was the, um, the king that Gretter was staying with when he robbed the sword out of the grave. And he did beautiful carving work. And I have actually brought this one with me. And so I'll have this up here after I'm done talking. And we can take a look at it up close. His carving work is beautiful. All of these bronze fittings are unique lost wax fittings. He carved them out of wax, made the molds from the wax, melted out the wax, cast the bronze, destroyed the molds, taking them out. They'll never be made. These pieces will never be made again. Every sword he makes has unique fittings that he makes for it. Okay, here's all, all the books that you, know, you could refer to for various things that I've talked about today. Um, this is the original uh, Richard Francis Burton, kind of one of the uh, first people in the great game, the, the prototype of James Bond. Uh, the guy that uh, uh, basically in the early 1800s, he, he disguised himself as a Muslim and did the pilgrimage to Mecca and argued religion on the steps of the mosque. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>
depends. Good old HP answer. It, yeah, no, it really does depend. Um, in what situation? Um, just in general, what types of swords do you appreciate the most? Okay, there's, there, there are several. Um, I love the uh, hand and a half, what's sometimes called the bastard sword, um, what this is right here. So it's, it's really a you know, one hand sword, but if you put two hands on it, man, you can do a lot of damage. So this is one of my favorite things. That's why, you know, Jim with the double edged Ken sword with the on, this is what I really wanted him to make, but he wouldn't do it, so I got the other one. Um, as I said before, I love uh, Gladius. Um, I guess if I was if I was going to wade into a um, if I was going to throw a uh, non pyrotechnic flashbang into a Taliban underground bunker that might be full of ammunition and, and wade in there, I'd want a Gladius and a Tomahawk. <laughs> so, that answer your questions? <laughs> yes. Um, how do you feel about Forged Empire? What is that? Oh, um, it's a show about forging. TV show? Yeah. I, I, I don't watch TV, sorry. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, back there first. Um, what's like the, is there a practical like, reason for the shape of the Kopech? Like, well, yeah, I mean, it, well, it, remember, originally it came from an epsilon axe, right? Which was a, a stick with then this kind of E-shaped epsilon that reached letter E axe blade on it. And then, well, gee, man, that's kind of hard to make. So why don't we just kind of make it, you know, we already got the axe blade. Why don't we just make, you know, one piece of metal and not have to get the stick and tie them all together and you know, things come loose and falls apart and stuff. And then, you know, common sense things like that as you go on along the dolphin. That's how I got it. Uh, in the blue shirt, back there. So, um, have you ever gotten cut when you've been using the swords, like, uh, well, I get into my, my rowdy past about that, but uh, <laughs> yes, I have a lot of cuts. When I, when I was a, a, a wild and wanton youth, uh, I used to hang around with bikers, and uh, I was already doing martial arts uh, at that time. I, I think I already had my second degree black belt in Taekwondo at that time. So I would challenge these guys to um, come at me with a knife, bare handed. So, yeah, that one is a, uh, that, that one there is a uh, uh, bayonet. Which I stopped and then grabbed the guy by the throat and twisted. <laughs> Same over. Um, you always have like many physics tools. Texas dueling scar here. Glass bottom and a Texas bar. No blades were involved in that. But I did take the guy's broken bottle. <coughs> yes. Oh, wait, you had one first. Said, how did you get then started on this collecting swords? Well, I, man, is it now? 52 years of martial arts and probably 49 of those doing sword combat, not fencing like an Olympic sport, but sword fighting as a martial art. And it's just an outgrowth of that. And then, you know, start doing this thing, and then, gee, hey, you go to engineering school and learn about metallurgy, and all this other stuff becomes interesting, too. So, you know, you've got, you got two facets to approach it from. Yes? Um, I know you said you don't watch TV, but anime and TV are not usually because of I don't, I don't know if I don't know if you've seen any of uh, any like really mainstream anime that have they have like these like extravagant oh. like magnificent swords. And they're eight feet like, long, right? Yeah. yeah okay. it ain't happening. You, you can't do that. <laughs> it ain't happening. Okay. I mean, actually. With like the jewels I, in the thing, and you know. I I made something like that. Naruto. He's the one that's got the matched twin swords, right? Mm -hmm. Um, Wait, no. Well, is there, the root of the guy with the match twin swords? I know you're thinking of the guy with the one big one, but no, I'm thinking of Sword Art Online, Kirito. He's a he's a he's a dual wielding. He has okay. he has two identical like really black like like the master of sword master. <laughs> okay. I, I, yeah, no, I'm I'm thinking of actually Jim Versulis made on order um, a smashed set of swords in blue scabbards for some guy and, the, and it was after, I think the guy, the character's name was Naruto, but the swords had to be able to fit in either scabbard, which was really, really hard. So Jim basically said, okay, it's going to be uh, $6,500 each, so 13000 bucks. And so the guy put down $6,500 when he was done. He didn't. He didn't have the other sixty-five hundred dollars to pay for it. So now you can buy both of those for the price of one sixty-five hundred dollars. Wow. 
from my, my friends at the Age of Chivalry who bought them from Jim. Uh, uh, in the back? Uh, no, uh, blue jacket? Um, yeah, I, I don't know if this is a good question, but is there like a Fibonacci sequence ratio for I mean, radio with swords? No, because there's so many different things that you can do with a sword, right? Remember that one slide I put up of all the different kind of medieval ways the sword was going into all of these different shapes and stuff like that. So, no, people have come up with literally hundreds of different things, and it's not really done mathematically. It's all kind of happened through trial and error through history. But in post thing, no one's found any particular proportion not, not of strength or powers. I mean, you know, you, in a particular, if you look at a single type of sword, you may be able to find some things in the geometry there. But there's so many different types. Of, you know, each maker is going to make them differently, especially in the old days when, you know, a sword made by one maker, even if it was trying to make the same thing, wouldn't be the same as, even when Jim makes two swords the same, they really aren't the same. So I, I think just because of the, the variability, you probably could not hold to a mathematical rigor. Yeah, I would like to um, check my, my understanding of pattern welding then is this thing that I had learned of without studying this as folded, you know, folded steel. Is that right? right? And it's the high carbon, low carbon. I mean, content. it doesn't have to be folded. You can make a mosaic pattern where you take like different pieces and just kind of weld them together like this, right? And, you know, you can make, I, I've said, had some people make blades that they have their names spelled out. So you said they're equally hard with the other process, and I guess I, I don't know. Oh, I, okay, so I'm saying today with modern steels, there's no advantage to a pattern welded blade except for its beauty. I see. And that's because of the crystalline structure or the... Because we don't, we don't need to, to do that high, low carbon steel to make something that's tough and strong anymore. It's just a single we, alloy. We can pick a perfect alloy yeah. and a perfect tempering you know, sequence to make that better than anything that could be made out of different kinds of steel. Other than their shape and usage, would you say that the uh, IDI were uh, forged any more efficiently than other swords from that time? I'd say the forging process itself, no doubt. I mean, if the same smith was doing it, two different, a Spatha or a Gladius, I mean, the forging would hopefully be identical in both cases. Now, I know sometimes when the blades get really big, they kind of get a little sloppy when you're trying to make them that long because you have them hold the thing and hammer on it, or when you're grinding it, you have them hold this thing and, and grind on it like this, it, you get more variability that way. For sure. So um, on some of the daggers that you have or knives, there's little rings on them and some that are worn. What are those used for? Rings on the knife. Put on the sheath. Oh, oh, that's for um, that's all oh, the Viking knives, right? That's how they would hold it on their belt. The the Vikings would carry their knives sideways across the back so that you could reach, and the blade pointing up, and you just reach in the back and pull it out like that. They carry those those short knives for the sideways, yeah. Um, okay. Oh, what's the future of sword making? Hard to say. Um, you know, it's not a, a business that you're going to make a lot of money in. You're either going to be somebody like like Jim, who's you know been spending 40 years cranking these things out, and you know you can you can buy um, an actual hand and a half from Jim, so one of these things, it's not a beater, but it's got a sharp edge, it's made, made for cutting things from Jim, for about seven or eight hundred bucks, which is pretty damn good for a uh, you know, quality product. And then, you know, you can, you, can, you can spend a lot more money, but uh, for something simple, you really don't need to spend much more money. The, the steels are not expensive steels. For a knife, you want something that's really, really hard and holds, holds, holds a really fine edge, which is why you can spend, you know, 100 or 200 or 500 bucks for a little blank of high quality steel to make a knife out of, and you haven't even made the knife yet. Um, did I, wait, did I finish answering your question? Did I get, get myself sidetracked? I do that. Just, so, just in the long term, what do you think? Of, what's the future? What's oh, yeah, right there. You go. There, so the old guys are all dying off, the masters are all dying off. There are some interesting new guys coming up, like uh, Yule and 
Jake Pounding, but like Jake Pounding, man, he just sits up in the studio and he does whatever he wants to do, and then every six or eight months he comes out, look at my latest masterpiece. No, I don't take commissions. <laughs> So anyway, I, th I think at this point we've reached the five o'clock mark. I think I've taken away from this talk for sure is by a bird from a pub in this country. It's going to be called the Gladius and Tomahawk. That's a great name. <laughs> yeah. uh, with that, let's thank our speaker again, and then we'll have a look at some sources as well. <laughs>